Okay, returning to talking about paired samples t-tests and all their interesting names that textbook publishers can't seem to agree on. Let's just walk through some examples. Now that you know how to do this, let's go through the example that I presented in the last lecture. I hope I got it right. Anyway, uh, it was the example of a treatment for social phobia, some sort of therapy. And there are 12 subjects and the dependent variable is heart rate. And pre-treatment heart rate is HR1. And so it's pretty standard to measure whatever it is you're trying to reduce before the therapy and then measure it again after the therapy. So let's say before the therapy, all 12 participants are put one by one, they're put into rooms with strangers and for a minute or two, and then you measure their heart rate. And then after treatment, you do the same thing. One by one, you put them in rooms with different strangers, of course. If it's the same strangers, that would screw up your study. So different strangers and you measure their heart rate. So we've got this, this setup going on here. And we've got the different scores already calculated. We want to know if the treatment is effective at alpha equals 0.01. So if d bar is greater than 0, then that means mean 2 is less than mean 1, which is what we want, right? If we're doing 1 minus 2, and then that value on average is greater than 0, then 1 is greater than 2. And so that's what we're looking at here. So we're going to look at the d bar scores only. Everything else just fades into oblivion. So we're just pretending like those d-bar scores are a single set of raw scores, and basically we're going to do a one-sample t-test on them. So our hypotheses, if we put them in words, they might be something like the null hypothesis, there's no difference in heart rates, and the alternative hypothesis, heart rate 2 will be lower on average than heart rate 1. In symbols, mu of d is 0. Equivalently, we could say mu1 equals mu2, and that's what we'd say for a paired samples t-test. And it's in mathematically the same, but let's keep with mu of d, so the mean of all possible uh, differences. And the alternative hypothesis, mu of d is greater than zero. And equivalently, it would be mu1 equals is greater than mu2. And now this is all dependent on all of our differences be being calculated as heart rate one minus heart rate two. If you reverse that, that's fine, heart rate two minus heart rate one, then the alternative hypothesis has to be mu d less than zero, and you have to reverse everything as you go through. Now with a, with a two-tailed test, it won't change your outcome, but it's good practice. And with a one-tailed test, it's critical. So this is a one-tailed test here, and this is our diagram. Distribution of all possible d-bars, of all possible mean difference scores from all possible samples, if the null hypothesis is true, the null hypothesis says that on average, the d-bar should be zero. Now, the t-critical is up there somewhere. We don't really know where, but we made a positive test. So let's figure out what t-critical is. Alpha I said was 0.01 in the positive tail. So if we look in our, ta in our table, we're going to need to find the, the uh, values for that column and the row for 11 degrees of freedom. Turns out it's, oops, 2.72. 11 degrees of freedom because n minus 1 is your degrees of freedom. Your degrees of freedom are the number of differences minus 1, not the number of individuals in the study minus 1. Number of differences, number of pairs minus 1. We really do treat this as a single sample t. We never go back to looking at the original data. We just think about it again after we're all done with our calculations. But during the calculations, no thinking about the original data, no thinking about the fact that you actually have 24 data points. As far as we're concerned, we have 12 data points, therefore n minus 1 is 11. Now, here's our updated graph that has t-critical, actually the value written in here. It's our diagram. So let's do the calculations and see if I can get these right. So there's the formula to find t-observed. We can just calculate that out. I'm just using the value from the table 20 as the standard deviation of the d-scores. So that's s sub d. That's where we just plug that. We just plug in that 20 there. I wouldn't worry too much about whether somebody happened to calculate that with an n minus one score and an n score. Just don't stress about that. Just take that value if it's given to you and divide it by n minus one. So working this out, we end up with a t observed of 1.71. So here we go. This is our final diagram here, and we can definitely see that we did not reject the null hypothesis. T observed 1.71 is not uh, very close to the rejection region. If we had had uh, alpha of 0.05, it would have been closer, but it still wouldn't have quite made it. <coughs> so our decision has to be a failure to reject the null hypothesis. And our conclusion might be something like, there was not a statistically significant decrease in heart rate after therapy compared to before therapy. T and then T 11 degrees of freedom is 1.71, P is greater than 
Here's another possible way to write that conclusion. Either one of these would work just fine. And there's probably other variations. Just got to get all the important information in there. So let's walk through another example. Cognitive therapy versus placebo therapy. Placebo therapy is often just talking to a friend or talking to a person who does active listening, which can be a nice thing, but your therapy better be better than that, otherwise why are people paying for it? So we often use a placebo therapy to evaluate whether a therapy is actually effective, as we hope it's going to be effective. So let's say all subjects in our study receive both cognitive therapy and placebo therapy. Now because I say this, now it can be a paired samples t-test. <coughs> it might actually make more sense to have our subjects receive just one or the other and do a between samples, an independent samples test. But for the sake of argument, and people do this from time to time, especially if you're short on subjects, then we might do this. Now, if you're going to do this, with this kind of thing, it's a good idea to do counterbalancing of the order. So if all your participants receive one treatment and another treatment, and you're going to compare those two treatments, it's a good idea to counterbalance the order. This is research design, not really stats. But some people would get cognitive therapy first, and some people would get placebo therapy first. And you would try and evenly match that and randomly assign which subjects got which, which ones, so that the, if there's any effect that, you know, just maybe whatever the first one was, or maybe the second one was, had the most effect. Maybe the effect builds up, and so you're better after the second therapy no matter what. Well, counterbalancing, you would uh, have the same number of first and second people for cognitive therapy as you had this as first and second people for placebo therapy and therefore the averages would kind of cancel each other out for the order effects and you'd actually just be left with a good comparison of the effectiveness of cognitive and placebo therapy. Anyway, that's a research design issue, not so much stats. Now this is a paired samples data situation and our question might be, does cognitive therapy result in a greater increase in social confidence scores? So there's our dependent variable rearing its ugly head. So let's say the dependent variable is some psychometrically valid measure of social confidence. <coughs> so here's our data. I put the names of the subjects in there to make it so, so obvious that uh, this is only one group of participants and each of them had two measurements. Each of them took two treatments. So here's our research question, our alpha level. And a little note, sometimes people do this. The research question is really a one-tailed question, but they do a two-tailed test just to kind of keep themselves a little more honest because it's harder to find a significant effect. It's harder to reject a two-tailed alternative hypothesis or two-tailed null hypothesis. Um, well, they're all two-tailed. It's harder to reject the null hypothesis if your alternative is two-tailed. And they do this to try and account for the possibility that cognitive therapy made clients' social confidence worse. Now, if you're a researcher, of course, maybe you're trying to find that cognitive therapy is better than the placebo therapy, but it sure would be good to report the results if you found the opposite. And so some people just choose to do a two-tailed test like this. There are some people who always do two-tailed tests all the time. So here are means and standard deviations. And so we can calculate those different scores and get the mean and the standard deviation of the differences. So if you see if you can work through this by yourself and then continue after your pause and we'll work through it here. So the hypotheses might be no difference in outcome versus cognitive therapy results in higher average outcome. But in symbols we'd, we'd probably put that as a, sorry, as a not equals, so it would be a two-tailed test. So actually I'll do that right now. So here are our hypotheses. Our hypotheses are in words that there's no difference in outcome between cognitive therapy and placebo. An alternative, cognitive therapy is better. It results in higher scores, higher um, <coughs> social confidence scores. Now, the way I approach this with this kind of odd but fairly common situation of researchers having kind of a one-tailed hypothesis but testing it with a two-tailed test is, I, I put that in symbols. So there's a two-tailed alternative hypothesis in the symbol version of the hypotheses here. So this was, would be maybe how you would set up your hypotheses, but somewhere you should put the two-tailed nature of the hypotheses, maybe all the places. So here's our, our diagram we would set up. We're going to have two decritical values. This is the distribution of all possible different scores 
Finding our critical T value, alpha is 0.05 in two tails, the same column as 0 0.10 in one tail. We have 10 subjects, 10 differences, therefore there are 9 degrees of freedom, and that gives us this T critical of 2.26. So now we can label that in there. And now let's go through and do the calculations despite the ghostly white square in the left hand of the screen. So here's your formula. Start plugging things into it. Start calculating. And eventually you should get something kind of like this. Kind of like a 2.46. Depending on rounding and a couple of decisions you might have made, it could end up being slightly different from that. But it should be very close. 2.46. The decision we have to make is to reject the null hypothesis. And our conclusion could be something like cognitive therapy uh, does result in statistically significantly higher social confidence scores after therapy compared to placebo. Now let's look at this business here. There's just a reminder of this important little blurb that you put at the end of your conclusion statements in research reports, papers, etc. Other researchers need to see this information in case they want to reanalyze your data, judge you harshly, etc. So you put the statistic type, which is T. You put the degrees of freedom, if your statistic has a degrees of freedom, which T definitely does all the time. Uh, you put the value, so it's going to be the T observed in this case, the value that you actually found in your study. And then you put something about the p-value. Some people report specific p-values, but other people will say it's much better practice to just put p as either greater than or less than your alpha level. And you've got to get that right. So, we know all the tests. And we're all done with this lecture.